there's a lot of variability in that process because it's subjective, because they're looking with their eyes. You could get three or four different pathologists to maybe give you three or four different diagnoses. You see this combination of science and technology and where technology could play a role. So I want to ask something very simple. Where is cancer today? And basically, what is the incidence of cancer in the Western world, if you like, in the industrialized society? And what do we expect is going to happen uh, in the next yeah. decades? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It's, it's interesting. Just the demographics, just this the rising aging population. I mean, cancer, first of all, to take a step back, is a disease, they say, of the aging. The longer you live, the more likelihood you are to develop cancer. And so we have a global population now that's the average getting older. Uh, there's larger segments of the population that are into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. People are living longer for good reasons. But as a result of that, we're seeing an increase and a rise in the incidence of cancer worldwide. Interestingly, last year, maybe the year before, was the first time, I think, in the United States, we started to see somewhat of a drop in mortality rates for certain kinds of cancers, particularly cancers like melanoma or lung cancer, where we've seen these great advances in certain areas, particularly uh, which we may talk about uh, immuno-oncology. And that has actually started to decrease uh, a little bit. But on the whole, this is still a major issue for us as a global population, is this rising in incidences in, uh, in cancer. The need basically for not only cure, but also detection of this disease in a early phase is on the rise, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's a gray area. Yeah, uh, it's difficult for a pathologist to make a diagnosis. Remember that game, uh, Find Waldo? So they're looking for Waldo in a sea of uh, things that confuse it. So pathologists oftentimes are looking for Waldo, or they're looking for small cancers. There's a lot of variability in that process because it's subjective, because they're looking with their eyes. You could get three or four different pathologists to maybe give you three or four different diagnoses. That's not necessarily their fault. It's because some of these diagnoses are very difficult to make. So where a computer and artificial intelligence can start to play now a role in this is if they, in an artificial intelligence way, can train a model to look at hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of cancers and non-cancers, the computer can start to learn much more accurately that there is indeed a cancer here or that there is indeed a particular protein that allows a patient to respond or not respond. So the reason that that is uh, becoming more relevant is because as treatments become more sophisticated, having a pathologist learn this and get it right has been difficult. It's been challenging. Immune cells are hard to see. So a computer can see them much better. So we can train computers to see certain proteins, certain cells, and to be a lot more accurate in determining which patient will be a good responder or not responder. Is artificial intelligence provide, if you like, more objectivity than subjectivity, or is doing also other things uh, in addition yeah. to that? Yeah, it does. It absolutely provides more objectivity, quantitation, quantitative data it can provide. And it also can do it at scale. So if anywhere where there's a human being involved, you're necessarily not at scale. <laughs> so one thing it can do is provide quantitative objective data, but it also can do it across hundreds of patients and maybe tens of trials, maybe clinical trials, so that we can do research in that way and kind of get to a place where we can discover more easily. So I think the scalability and the objectivity of the digital technology versus manual microscope is a big advantage.